Have you seen the interview that Jonathan Majors just did with Good Morning America? This is the first interview and the first time that he's talking since the conviction, but we're going to talk about it right now from a licensed therapist perspective. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Keandra Jackson, licensed marriage and family therapist. If you're new here, hey, but if you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for being here. Just in case you've been under a rock, Jonathan Major sat down with Lindsay from Good Morning America, and this comes after his conviction of a misdemeanor of reckless assault and harassment. And this all happened after his two-year relationship that he had with Grace Jabari. And he called the relationship toxic, dangerous and unhealthy, which obviously it was because it led him into this very situation. So before we get into the real tea, let me know in the comment section, what are your thoughts about Jonathan Major, about this whole assault, alleged assault situation? And what do you think should happen with his career moving forward? Should he be blackballed from the industry or does he deserve a second chance? This is a really hot topic right now because Jonathan Majors was at the freaking height of his career when all of this went down. I'm talking about he was Kang on Atman. He was on Creed 3. He did The Last Man or The Last Black Man in San Francisco. He was doing some major work. And I personally think that he's a great actor. But this is a very unfortunate situation. And it begs the question of why now? Why come forth now? Why all of a sudden you want to talk about this now instead of talking about it when it first happened? And the interesting thing that he said when Lindsay posed this question is that he said essentially responsibility. He's like, look, I got a responsibility to my followers, to my fans and to the black culture to share my side of the story of how it really went down. Now, one thing about me and my channel, y'all know I don't play about abuse of any kind, whether that's physical, emotional, spiritual, verbal, whatever. I do not play about abuse. But the tables turned a little bit because I remember on the shade room and the Jasmine brand and especially in the black and African-American community, when this first dropped, everybody was like, oh, no, another another black man with another white woman and this is ruining his career. I can't believe he would do something like this, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as that footage <laughs> came out with him running full speed and Grace Jabari chasing him, everybody was like, oh, well, how is it that he was abusive and he did all of these things to her physically and emotionally and all of the things. And then why would she chase him? You know, like if somebody was whooping your tail as strong and as big and as manly Jonathan Major seems to be, you would be running from your assailant, right? So this really painted him in a very different light. And we're glad that the footage came out because it really told a different side of the story than initially expressed. Now, according to her, Jonathan Major's in the car, punched her in the face, twisted her arm behind the back, broke her middle finger, like cut something on the back of her ear. There was a whole bunch of different injuries that she experienced, but Jonathan Major said he don't know how any of those injuries took place because he didn't do it. He said he has never engaged in any type of physical abuse of a woman, period. Period. Now, I will be 100% honest with you. I had no idea until I watched this part of the interview, actually today, that Grace Jabari, hours later after this incident, was found unconscious in the closet of their apartment. When Jonathan Majors had to call 911, everything shifted and changed. One of the quotes and the things that he mentioned in some of the evidence, he said one of his worst fears came true by calling 911 as a black man in America. Now, if you're not a person of color, if you're not a black man or a black woman, you may not fully understand, even if you're an ally, you may not fully understand what that means, especially when you're dealing with a Caucasian woman, right? You are automatically deemed as the culprit. You're automatically villainized. You're automatically seen as the one who did it. You're basically guilty before any and everything else. So for us to sit here and think that race doesn't play a role in this, we would absolutely be lying because if the tables was turned, right? And if she was a white male and he was a black woman, I don't know if this would have went down the exact same. Because from what I heard and seen, she was arrested, but she was never convicted. And he also had injuries on his face and injuries on his wrist and hands too. Where did he get those injuries from? 
So as I was watching this interview, to be honest with you, I was shocked that he got so emotional. I kind of felt like he was going to come on here trying to play the victim and say that she was wrong and she did this and she did that. But when I was watching it, I honestly felt a lot of empathy for him. I honestly felt that he was truthful. And I also felt, too, that he was taking responsibility for his actions. He did not appear to be perfect, but he said, yeah, I fooled around on her. Yes, I broke her heart. I'm guilty of those things, but I'm not guilty of physical abuse that I am convicted of. And even with the physical abuse piece, he talked about him witnessing domestic violence. He didn't say whom he witnessed it from, but I'm going to make the assumption that it was either his parents or some type of primary caregivers or someone in his family. So he said that he has witnessed domestic violence and he's even been hit before. I'm assuming getting spanked or whooped as a kid, but also that he never put hands on a woman in that aspect. And I get it. When you've witnessed abuse, especially as a child, it's really hard to come back from that, right? It, it leaves a lasting scar on you. I've also witnessed, you know, my dad being physically abusive to my mom, right? Like I will never forget that because that happened when I was a child. So I understand how it leaves an imprint on you that nobody can really take away, but that doesn't automatically mean that you are also going to go start hitting and beating on women either. So it's important for us to realize that we need to look at this from a particular vantage point. And him being and saying that essentially he has had suicidal ideations his whole life from when he was a kid on the farm in Texas. And he has had these thoughts was whoa for me because I did not know that he experienced suicidality. I didn't know he experienced suicidal thoughts. And he basically told us that he did. And he's been experiencing them from a young child, but he has been working to keep those things at bay. So I'm going to make the assumption that he has a support system. I'm going to make the assumption that he probably is in therapy. I'm going to make the assumption that he's doing what he needs to do to make sure that he doesn't fall into this depressive state or want to end it all essentially because of how he's feeling. And this goes back to the point that I always tell y'all when we're talking about celebrities. Again, we never know what people are going through. We see their fame, their money, their notoriety, the women, the this, the that, right? But we don't realize their backstory. We don't realize what they have been through or what they're currently going through. And we put them on this pedestal because they make a lot of money and they have a lot of influence, but they deal with the same stuff that me and you deal with on a regular basis. My heart truly went out to him when he said he has a daughter whom he hasn't seen because of all of the things that have been happening in his life over the last few months. That's heartbreaking for a father, especially an active father who wants to be involved in their daughter's life, to not be able to see their kid and their child, to not be able to see them when they were an active father and present before. That's heartbreaking. And you can tell all over his face when he was talking about his daughter that it is breaking his heart. So part that made me chuckle a little bit is like some audio recording that they found him stating that he was a great man and that he needed a great woman behind his side and he needed his woman to be like a Coretta Scott King or a Michelle Obama. And I'm like, Jonathan, you are aware that this is a very white woman. <laughs> like, how are you going to make this comparison? But I understand the sentiment of what he was trying to say, but it was still a very interesting comparison and analogy. And he might have should have used somebody else as an example for that. Now, there is absolutely positively no way that we're going to end this video without talking about Megan Good. Now, when they first started dating and they got together, I was like, is this real or is this a publicity stunt? Or are you trying to redeem yourself because you were just with um, a white woman? Now you're trying to get a black woman. Like, what's going on here, Jonathan? Tell me. But as the months have gone by... It seems like their relationship is legit and that they're solid. And to be honest with you, she has been right by his side. I haven't seen any videos, any footage of them not being together or not holding hands or not kikied and cuddled up. She seems to be right by his side during, I would arguably say, one of the most difficult times of his life. And during this interview, he said, she's an angel. I'm so blessed to have her. He said, even though this is a fresh and a new relationship, I think I found her. Essentially meaning he think he's found the one. Now I'm all here for black love, but to give my final thoughts on this, I think 
that there are going to be a lot of people who are never going to be able to look at Jonathan Majors the same. We all know that a lot of his media projects and a lot of the, the, the money, let's be honest, that he was supposed to get for opportunities, a lot of brands, a lot of networks, they don't want to align with all of the things that he has going on because it's a bad look on them, right? If Marvel don't want to rock with you, right, because you're going to be a bad look, then that means all of the notoriety and the coin that came with being Kang is removed from you. So there's going to be a lot of people who's never going to be able to really look at him the same, unfortunately. And I hope that they do because there's a lot of other people who are not people of color who has done some really shady, jacked up and messed up things in this industry. And then a few months later, even a year later, we don't even remember it. We forget about it. But when you are someone who is in the limelight and has a lot of the experiences and you're a black male, you honestly don't have, you're not put up to the same standard as other people. And y'all can argue about that if you want to, but let's be real and let's call a spade a spade. So I'm just glad that with everything happening that he's finally able to speak up. He's finally able to state his peace. He has a woman by his side and a support system within him that is going to help him get through this. I'm pretty sure that he has a legal and a PR team who is encouraging him to share his part of the story because this is just going to be the beginning stages of him rebuilding his career and getting back on track. He also said that he's hopeful that he's going to work in this entertainment industry again. And I believe that to be the case. I'm hopeful for that to be the case. I think it might be a little while because people are going to want to see how this plays out. But until then, hopefully he gets to really start rebuilding his life and people will forgive him and allow him to have a second chance. So thank you so much for watching another video on my channel. I hope you like, comment, subscribe, stay connected with me, and I will see you next time. Bye!